me, I look at our mission and pointing an arrow directly at that part of our mission that says, as FIS teachers, we work to ensure a dynamic inquiry driven education. What does that look like to you and in your classroom? I like that you pulled it up in the mission because when I was making the decision to come here, that was one of the things that I actually really liked about the mission statement because it's something I believe in as a science teacher. For me, what it means is that my kids are discovering science and that they are the ones who are figuring out information. Um, what it looks like to me is instead of me handing them knowledge, they are uncovering knowledge for themselves. So I teach one section of sixth grade science and four sections of seventh grade science. And we are currently rolling out a new curriculum, which is the next generation science standards. Um, it's actually not a curriculum. It's a, it's a set of standards. And what's really cool about them is that the standards are emphasizing the importance of a well-rounded learner. And so rather than being purely content driven as standards often have been in the past, they're broken into three dimensions where we have one dimension called the disciplinary core ideas, which that's the content. What do students need to know? But then we have the science and engineering practices, which is what will the students need to be able to do to demonstrate their understanding of what they know. And then finally, we have what are called the CCCs, the cross cutting concepts, which are um, how students think about their learning. And so these are the same types of concepts that you would see in any other content area. We've got cause and effect, we've got systems and system models, um, we have structure and function. And so all of these kind of big ideas that represent how the students are going to be thinking about the science. Good. Would it be fair to say that you're a constructivist when it comes to knowledge? That 100%, I believe that. I think there's absolutely times where uh, my job is to maybe steer us towards an understanding, especially if there's misconceptions that I'm observing. Absolutely. Um, and I'm going to actually share my screen again to show this other image that I'm pretty sure Dave Hawthorne from Learning Support showed this to me the first time. And a lot of times when people hear inquiry and constructivism, the knee-jerk reaction is to go into this deep end of the pool that it's free inquiry where students choose their topic and they decide what they're doing and they decide the you know, learning outcome and all of those kind of things. And while that can happen, students need a base knowledge and they don't come to us with that base knowledge. We have to provide that. Get some examples of what you're up to. Yeah, so um, another thing that's really cool about this new curriculum is that we teach it in a way that is phenomenon driven. Um, so our first unit in seventh grade, our phenomenon was bath bombs. And we actually launched this unit on Zoom. If you remember, the seventh graders had a positive case really early in the year and had to go home. I do remember I was on a two week quarantine because That's of that right. in my tiny little apartment. That's right. So that was a that was an interesting start to the year. And launching a phenomenon is usually kind of a big day where we all are curious and investigating this new phenomenon. We did it over Zoom. And from here, we, we launched immediately into a procedure that we follow when we introduce a new phenomenon, which is what do you notice and what do you wonder? Uh, so what really gets us into kind of the beef of our inquiry is what do you wonder mm -hmm. about this phenomenon? And so each student typed up two or three questions that they had. And I went back later and I kind of grouped their questions into categories and this is where we kind of get that that feeling of the students are developing questions of things that they want to know but the teacher really knows where the unit needs to end up we know where the learning needs to go so i can kind of group these together and i can say okay well they want to know why the temperature changed great that's going to hit endothermic yeah. and exothermic reactions they want to know you know um why did this happen great that's going to hit chemical reactions and so I'm certainly still maintaining a certain level of control over this, but. And so it is a manipulation, but it's a manipulation with a intention of letting the students, their inquiry guide, maybe the sequencing of, mm -hmm. or maybe the process of how these things are taught. Exactly. Yeah. 
what will you carry forward from the DLP? You know, since adopting in GSS, looking at authentic ways of assessing students has been um, a huge priority and my assessments have changed drastically in the last five years in general. But being on DLP and you ask me what's something that's gonna carry over assessment practices. I have had to get really creative with my team about how are we going to assess this when we can't give them what we would ordinarily give us just a test, a written assignment. And so these creative tasks that we're giving them to do at home on a different timeline, like you said, how are we going to bring that back into the classroom when, when we're no longer on DLP? And can we push ourselves to continue working towards these more authentic forms of assessment, even though we're going to get back into a classroom where it's easy to just hand them a piece of paper and give them a, a traditional written test?